Hey. Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Crane, and we're going to talk about programming in Rust today. Um, before we do that, I want to provide a little context about programming languages and their history and define a few terms. Um, you may see this term system software thrown around sometimes, and I'll talk about it a little bit in this presentation. System software is usually that software that sits between applications and the hardware. And systems programming are the programming languages that we use to write this software. So think about things like operating systems, embedded systems that have to do things where, like memory mapped I.O., you know, like you're really close to the hardware and you're really concerned about performance, not using too much memory, stuff like that. And the sort of most common systems programming language is uh, the C programming language. Um, we use it a lot in industrial control systems because we're doing a lot of things on bare metal. Um, it was invented in 1972 by Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs. And since that time, 48 years later, um, aside from maybe some minor standardization efforts and very kind of modern, uh, minor modernizations, it's still the same programming language from 1972. And if you think about that in context, there aren't a lot of technologies that we use in industrial controls that are that old. Even Modbus, well, maybe you're laughing because you know some, but even Modbus was invented and, you know, like published in 1979 by Schneider. So if you think about that same language and that same tooling from 1972 is still what we lot of, write a lot of code in today. Um, and since that time, you know, like security has evolved, the industry's involved, we're asked to write more software faster with more functionality than ever before. So if you take, you know, one thing away from this presentation, I want it to be that you know, if there are a lot of bugs, it's really not because we haven't trained developers hard enough. We've had this mantra, you know, if only we taught our developers secure coding practice, if only they use the tools that we provided them, we'll have fewer bugs and we'll get a handle on all this patching. That's just not true. That's insanity. I found a great tweet this year that kind of sums that attitude up. The reason that we can't get a hold of bugs is that we have not given developers tools that are fit for purpose, for what they need to do on a daily basis when they're programming system software. So this is a talk about Rust. Um, and before we get into the nitty gritty details about Rust, we'll kind of classify how Rust relates to other programming languages and the purposes for which we might use Rust. Um, I won't read all this to you, but the big points are here is that Rust can, uh, is compatible with C at the application binary interface level. You can call C from Rust, and you can call Rust from C. And that has a lot of nice properties that we'll uh, look at later. And then unlike all the other languages like C and C++ in its class, Rust offers both memory and thread safety. And it, so it, and it does that with pretty much no overhead. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can kind of categorize, you know, put different programming languages into different buckets, and we'll go through that on two slides. One way that you can think about categorizing programming languages is the execution model. Um, on the far left here, um, we have sort of the scripted languages like Python and Ruby, where you actually load the code onto your deployment target, and an interpreter runs that code on your machine. Now, I would contend that in almost all ICS environments, if you find Python or Ruby floating around, that's probably not functionality. That's probably an indicator of compromise, <laughs> right? Um, in the next category, we have uh, sort of the compile once, run anywhere languages, where you compile it to some kind of intermediate representation, like a bytecode, and then you execute it on a virtual machine. Now, we see these languages a lot in ICS, probably .NET more than Java, because we're Windows-oriented, uh, but we see them in our HMIs, our data historians. We don't tend to see them on PLCs, but we, we do see them in our environments. And then on the far right, we have things that are compiled directly to machine code. All right? and you compile a binary and it only runs on one target. And those are languages like C++, C++ Go, and Rust. So those three languages are really in the same category. And then as we move left to right, we're generally talking about increases in performance, uh, lower memory usage, et cetera. And another important way that's relevant to this talk for how you can categorize languages is memory management. The languages in this first category on the left are so-called automatic or garbage-collected languages. Developers don't have to worry about 
how they deallocate memory. They kind of just create objects on the fly, and then occasionally there's like this GP, GC pause, and uh, the runtime figures out you know, what's not being used or referenced anymore, and things go away. But that has a cost, uh, especially for real-time programming. It takes extra memory. You allow all this memory to accumulate, and then suddenly you know, it disappears. Um, and then there's the other class of languages that have so-called um, uh, manual memory management. So the developer in these languages has to be very concerned about the difference between the stack and the heap. And if you're doing embedded systems, you may not even have the heap at all. You know, if you're writing a satellite for space, you may generally like plan out, this is all the memory my program is ever going to use, and it's all on the stack, and it's all pre-allocated. So Rust kind of sits alone with C and C++ in that category among common languages. Yes, there are other languages that can do that, but not ones that sort of have all the same properties and all the same usage. Um, before we get into some code samples, let's talk about common vulnerabilities that we see in C and then how Rust mitigates them. The first one uh, is called a dangling reference, or in C we might call this a dangling pointer. pointer. This occurs when you have some object, you pass it somewhere else in your program by reference or by pointer, and then that object goes away for some reason. Maybe you pack, pass back from a function a reference to something on the stack, you do something silly like that, and then the program crashes later because of some undefined behavior. So Rust mitigates this at compile time. It does this with a sophisticated part of the compiler called the borrow checker, and we'll look at some examples of that. Um, another common one is use after free. This happens when you allocate an object, you do some stuff with it, you deallocate it, and then you try to use it again, right? And you don't know what's at that memory address anymore, and you have undefined behavior. Rust also mitigates at this compile time. It uses a different mechanism for this. It has, Rust has a sort of ownership concept that it uses to kind of track what things are live and what things have been deallocated. Uh, no pointer dereferences. Uh, this occurs like when you have something that you never used and never allocated and you try to use, right? It's just a, a zero memory location. Rust also handles this at compile time but using the type system. Um, and it does that by just not having a null type. <laughs> um, sort of the canonical example of security bugs, buffer overflows, overreads, stuff like that, out of bounds, reads, write. Rust handles this at runtime, um, and a lot of other languages also handle this at runtime. Java, C Sharp, those languages also handle it at runtime. And if you think about the problem, if you have a function where you're sort of passing in a buffer that has a uh, variable length or length that you don't know at compile time, this is kind of the best you can do. So Rust can transform these kind of vulnerabilities into a denial of service instead of a memory corruption. Um, but there are also some sort of techniques you can use with the Rust type system to write so-called panic-free code. A panic is what occurs in Rust when you basically try to access memory that's outside of a certain bound. Um, and perhaps the most interesting and innovative of these mit uh, mitigations is Rust protections for multi-threading. The type system actually understands what types and structs are safe to share across thread boundaries and it will prevent you at compile time from doing, from creating data races, which is actually a, a pretty incredible property. And we'll look at some examples of that as well. And then lastly, uh, integer overflow and underflow is another common cause of uh, vulnerabilities in software, and this is another um, runtime mitigation. And you'll notice I put a little asterisk there on the last one. There's actually a little caveat with that, that's only in debug mode because that has more of a performance um, implication. You can turn it on in release mode if you know it meets your performance and timing goals, um, but you don't get that by default in release mode. Okay, code samples. So as you can see, Rust looks fairly similar to C. If you program some C throughout the course of your career, you can kind of read Rust. This first program has two functions that do pretty much the same thing. One takes a heap allocated string by value, and the other takes a heap allocated string by reference, and it prints that string to the console. And our little program basically just, you know, allocates a heap allocated string, and then calls those two functions by reference and by value. Um, in the first function, in Rust semantics, when we take a reference to a value, we borrow that value. So in the Rust compiler, through its borrow checker that I mentioned previously, 
actually does some really sophisticated static analysis to know what's safe to borrow and what's not. And then in that second function call, say hello by value, ownership of that variable is transferred into this function. So this function, say hello by value, now owns the variable name. It prints name. And then at the end of the scope, there's no longer an owner for this value, so this gets dropped and deallocated from memory. So that's what's going on in this program. And Rust will let you compile this, and it'll print, hello, Jim, hello, Jim. But what if we do the same program, but we switch the order of these statements? So we first move ownership of the, uh, the variable name, and we print it by name. And then we try to uh, say hello by reference and uh, print that same variable by reference. Well, the compiler very helpfully informs us that we can't do that because we moved that value in the first call and it knows that name is basically a, a dead moved variable and it won't let us do that. So this is an example of the Rust compiler basically preventing a use after free, if that makes sense. And you can see that it's kind of very helpful telling you exactly where these different things occurred and telling you why you can't do that. Okay, so another topic, borrowing. Um, this is a little more complicated. Um, we have a simple structure called value that just wraps a 32-bit integer, and we've written a function here called select largest. You pass in two of these structs by reference, and all it does is select the one that has the larger inner value. Very trivial example, but there's a good reason why I didn't just use integers that I'll explain. And then in our program, we create two of these with two different numbers. We select the largest. Largest here is a reference to the largest value, not a copy. And then we just print what the larger value was. And the compiler happily lets us do that. It says the largest value is 77. Okay. Um, let me actually go back. Now, one thing that will look foreign from C here is the only thing was perhaps what are these tick A's and what do they mean? Okay. So this is Rust parlance for um, a concept called lifetimes. And you can think about any program you've ever in C, but this, it has life variables have lifetimes, right? They exist, they're used, and they don't exist. And all, a lot of security problems in C come down to when you try to use something after its lifetime has expired, right? So this, these fun, fanny tick A's are kind of Rust's way of saying that the reference that I return from this function cannot live longer than either of the variables I pass in. Okay, so that's sort of what that means in Rust syntax. And in a lot of cases, you don't have to explicitly write these lifetimes. They can be elided, and the compiler will kind of figure them out for you. But in rare circumstances, you actually have to write them out. So what if we write the same program, but uh, before we print the reference, we try to print one of the two variables by value? So right there, after we've basically gotten a reference to the largest one, we try to print one of them by value, and we transfer ownership of x into that function. The compiler says, you can't do that. You borrowed x here. The reference is still alive. You moved it here, and then you're trying to use it again. Don't do that. That's not safe. Okay. So this is an example of the Rust compiler preventing a dangling pointer or a dangling reference. OK. Last example of compiler messages is concurrency. Let's say we want to write a program where we have some 64-bit counter, and we want to safely increment that same counter for multiple threads. There's all kinds of ways we could do this incorrectly in C, but we'll find out why Rust won't let us. But just to take you through what's happening here, we create this reference-counted smart pointer. We uh, have an array of join handles that we'll use to kind of track our threads that we launch. We launch 10 threads, and in each thread, we just increment the counter once, sort of pushing those handles into our, our list. Then we join on those threads, waiting for them to finish their work, and then we print the result. But what does the compiler have to say about this? Now, this may look a little foreign, and this is where the Rust learning curve starts to kick in. Um, it basically says that this type, standard RC, reference count RC, cannot be sent between threads safely. And you're thinking, well, I'm giving you an atomic, or I'm giving you a reference counted smart pointer, what's the problem? Well, there are different pointer types in Rust. This is a single threaded reference counted smart pointer, and Rust won't let you do it. It turns out that there's actually a um, ARC, or an ARC, an atomic reference counted smart pointer that 
is safe to pass between threads. So we'll go back and we'll modify our program. But you'll see that Russ is saying that the trait marker send is not implemented for RC. So the clue here is that the Rust type system is concurrency aware. It uses the types and the type system to enforce thread safety. So we need a type that implements this send trait so that we can send our counter to multiple threads and have it used safely. Well, it turns out that the correct solution to this problem, or at least one of the correct solutions to this problem, is to use this arc. And if you've ever programmed in C++, this is the equivalent of a shared pointer. It's a pointer where you have a handle to an object and multiple threads. And when you go to deallocate that object, the deallocation or the usage counter is thread safe. So when the last reference disappears, the object is deallocated. But in C, if you, you, know, if you tried to pass something like this that counted references unsafely to multiple threads, you could have a double free. And then to have our counter also be thread safe, we need to wrap it in a mutex. So if you compile this sort of modified version with the right types, um, you can get count as 10 in a multi-threaded program. OK, so that's sort of the deep technical portion. And the rest of the talk, I'm really going to try to sell you on a different aspect of Rust, which is its productivity. I'm going to kind of egomaniacally call this Crane's al uh, axiom, but I think that other people have said this before in different ways. And I think that the adoption of Rust is inevitable, not because of the security benefits, but because of the productivity. The C++ ecosystem is just like, or C is incredibly fragmented, and it's very difficult to write software. But I would say that Rust is very pragmatic, and it comes with a whole slew of tools that we'll look at that make developers more productive. And software engineering is a bit of an art, and software developers develop an intuition for how much they trust or how much confidence they have in your code. And I can tell you from programming for a long time in these different languages, when you write Rust, you really walk away with a sense of confidence that the code is correct and it will do what it's supposed to do. Um, other people have said this before, too. <laughs> um, you can think of, you know, this is the Rust team and this is Rust and these are the developers giving them their medicine. Um, the Rust ecosystem, uh, I like to say that it's batteries included. It comes with a full package manager build system. It's not fragmented like we see in uh, sort of C++ development. Uh, the Rust compiler is just a front end. It compiles the language to an intermediate representation so we can take advantage of all the nice back ends that LLVM supports. And it already supports so many of the embedded architectures that we see in industrial controls, lots of ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, et cetera. It also compiles to WebAssembly, which is kind of cool. Maybe not for this space so much, but you can write Rust and actually run the transpiled code in a browser. And then it has really nice documentation. So that's uh, one of the strengths of Rust, I would say, is that the libraries and the tools in that ecosystem are extremely well documented. So here's just a screenshot of um, crates.io, which is the website. Um, if you've ever used uh, Python, you're familiar with what's Python's tool? for package management? Pip. Yeah, pip. OK, so Cargo is kind of like pip, but for Rust. And uh, crates.io is kind of the central repository. And you can see that there's kind of a growing number of crates available here. Um, Rust has a lot of killer language features, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about them. Um, my favorite at the moment happens to be this feature called async await. Uh, I write a lot of networking code, a lot of kind of concurrent networking code. And async await kind of allows you to write asynchronous stuff that you, you know, in C or C++, you'd have all these callbacks, you'd have to worry about the lifetimes of things, and Rust allows you to write very synchronous looking code that gets compiled down to state machines and runs on top of, um, like, on a thread pool. So that's really, really cool for writing protocol drivers. Um, when is Rust not a good fit? Um, I would say that if you're a vendor in this space and you have a large investment already in uh, products for Windows that run Java, C Sharp, Go, stuff like that. Mixing in Rust is probably not a good idea. You're already getting a lot of the security mitigations already, perhaps not the multi-threading stuff, and the integration probably will be more of a pain than it's worth. Um, if you don't have a development staff that is really interested in Rust, um, learning curve is more difficult in Rust than it would be to you know, onboard Go, Java, C Sharp developers, but I do think it's easier than C and C++, to be honest. And then obviously the, the ecosystem and, and the libraries available are still more limited compared to some other options. So if you're really dependent on something that sort of hasn't landed in open source yet in Rust, that could be a problem. <laughs>
Um, when is Rust a good fit in ICS? Um, I'll really focus on the second example, but if you have a completely greenfield application that has certain requirements, like it needs to be fast, real-time, low memory, you need really good guarantees of stability, I think Rust is a good fit. Um, the second use case, though, um, I think is more attractive for a lot of vendors in this space. If you have a legacy code base with C++, you can kind of chip away at that with Rust because of that you know, compatibility at the ABI level. You can write Rust libraries, expose them with the C API, and replace components. So Rust was originally developed by Mozilla to do exactly this for the Firefox web browser. They've been gradually chipping away at Firefox, you know, um, replacing high-risk components, components that take untrusted inputs, for example. And perhaps closer to this community, the Suricata IDS has slowly been doing that with their protocol parsers as well. So if you go and search Suricata Rust, you can find some nice blog posts about them talking about replacing protocol parsers in their IDS with Rust. Um, so as part of this talk, we have released a uh, Modbus library in Rust, and of course, if you were to write one in Rust, you would call it Rodbus. <laughs> um, just uh, a few things about this release. It's available on crates.io right now, so if you go on Windows or Linux, you install Rust. With a single command, you can go and type cargo install Rodbus client, and you'll have a command line Modbus client that you can use. So even if you're not a programmer, um, Rust has a lot of useful command line tools that you can easily pull down and compile. And then to sort of demonstrate this for vendors, we've also provided uh, a C API shim. And it's, it's pretty much zero cost. It's not like you know, bindings in other languages where there's a runtime penalty for that layer. So you can compile this library get, um, and get headers and just seamlessly link it into an existing C or C++ code base. You know, here's a little code sample in Rust and then there's basically the same program running in C. Now, of course, you do lose some safety guarantees, right? But the inner library that's doing all the Modbus stuff is still you know, compiled Rust code and has those safety guarantees, even though you lose some across that compatibility boundary. Um, a few benchmarks just to talk about the performance differences, perhaps between C and C++ Rust. With, uh, you know, not doing any profiling or optimization, our little library on my develop machine running in a VM can hit 200,000 requests, sec 200, requests per second. So that's, you know, multiple clients talking to multiple Modbus servers. And it can, what's perhaps most impressive is it does all of that in less than a meg of RAM. So Rust is really appropriate for sort of, you know, you, you may not need that much performance in your application, but this is also a, ten, uh, you know, a testament to how lightweight the end result is in terms of memory and CPU footprint. Um, we're going to take this release a little further. Um, I was hoping to have it done before this talk, um, but we're going to integrate uh, Rodbus with uh, Russell's, which is Rust TLS library. And we're going to not just wrap it in TLS, but also implement the uh, the parts of the X509 validation that the secure Modbus folks have published to allow you to do role-based authorization on Modbus devices. So you can, you know, in, from an X509 certificate, enforce that a certain client cert only has read access to that device. And I hope we, you know, if they're here, I'd love to talk to them at the, at the conference this week and uh, see if there's some possible collaboration. And then we kind of plan to also bind this into, into other languages. Um, Regarding performance, um, there's a nice blog post here that talks about comparing Russell's, the Rust TLS library, to OpenSSL. So if you still don't believe me that Rust is fast, it was faster than OpenSSL in almost in every category that they measured. And perhaps most impressively, it used less than half the memory of OpenSSL for those applications. So. People should take Rust seriously for embedded programming, especially if you're going to be adding security into your application. Um, so, in summary, you know, Rust is, is a modern competitor for C and C++, for embedded systems, uh, operating systems, device drivers, all those sorts of things. I think it will be adopted primarily because of the boost in productivity. Dale talks a lot about technologies that are kind of like a step function for change. I think that sort of from the development perspective, Rust could be one of those step functions 
for this space that could, could sort of stop the bleeding with, or at least slow the bleeding and patching that we, you know, that, that we talk about so much. And thirdly, um, Rust kind of got a bad reputation in its early days for people going to open source projects and say, you should rewrite this in Rust. And you're like, but this is 70,000 lines of code and I don't have the time. You know, don't do that to people. You can you know, chip away at those high-risk components in your legacy systems um, just by using Rust compatibility with C. And that's it, and I'd love to have some questions. So uh, uh, besides hacking on uh, industrial control systems a lot, then uh, I do lots of work for the big tech companies, uh, spend t lots of time auditing hypervisors and stuff like that. And there's been a lot of attempts because we desperately need something more safe than C to throw more modern languages into the middle. Um, but uh, so for example, um, Microsoft rewrote all their PDF logic in higher level type say languages and then at the end, it wasn't performant enough, chew up, chewed up too much memory, they threw it away and rewrote in C again, or C++. And so, uh, um, uh, so usually what happens is right at the end of a project is when you figure out the language you chose isn't appropriate because now it uses too much time, it t spends too much time in locks, it spends uh, too much time in allocating and decaling, it spends too much time uh, tracking pointers and all those things, and right at the end of the project you realize your project can't work anymore. And so then the type safe languages get thrown away and things go back. And so I have a couple of questions for you. One is, uh, um, how many real full systems have been implemented in Rust um, so that, uh, that we can get a feel for um, feel for if it's going to find all these same stumbling blocks in the middle of it? And two is during your comparisons, did you compare between C++ um, or C? Um, because the overhead of a C++ compiler is significant, just taking C code and recompiling it just with the C++ compiler is com uh, significant. And, Things like C++14 takes lots, lots more memory than like C++11. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, so uh, if we're adopting Rust into the middle of those, um, how mature is it on kind of that scale? I would say it's a lot of questions. Let me try to answer. Okay. I may not answer them in order. Um, uh, yes. As far as maturity, I, I probably wouldn't have recommended Rust three years ago. The language, I think they started in 2010 or 2012, and it was constantly evolving, which was a major sore point for users. They were constantly changing things. But they stabilized in 2018, and basically, they're going to remain backwards compatible going forward. So from that perspective, stability-wise, I would, I would recommend using it. Um, in terms of big users using it, um, I didn't really prepare for that question. I, 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 n there's no one that I know of using it in ICS at the moment. Um, I have a customer that's going to let us swap this Modbus library in just as kind of a feel good. But um, outside of industrial control systems in the broader software engineering space, they're seeing pretty huge adoption by, by big names for big projects at, at, at the moment. I don't have any off the top of my head, but it's, it's climbing quickly. Um, in terms of overheads, we didn't do any comparisons ourselves to see. I've seen some out there. That comparison to OpenSSL is to OpenSSL, which is written in C. Um, so I would, you know, I wouldn't call Rust a faster language than C. I think that when developers have more time to do profiling and think about those things, and less time working, you know, worrying about minutia, that they can produce software that runs faster. I don't think that this outperforms OpenSSL because. It's just so dramatically better. I think that the productivity boost offered by Rust allows them to write faster software. And a lot of it is LLVM optimizations in Magic 2. Um, yeah, no, I was, I was mostly asking, uh, um, I think we need a, something like Rust. Uh, I was just wondering how far it was along the ma maturity model. Maturity model, I would say it's, it's worth looking into right now. Okay. Yeah, we've kind of hit that cusp, I would say, in the last year. Just to comment on that last question, I know there's a project called like Talk OS. They've rewritten an operating system uh, completely yep. in Rust, so it seems like that's maybe a good model to look at. That's a great example, and there's all kinds of beginner boards you can get for embedded systems to start playing with Rust in embedded environments and RTOS is like Talk, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of a comment slash question. Uh, one of the universities we work with, their operating system course is now, now uses Rust. It doesn't use C anymore. So can you comment on what you're seeing from young people coming out of universities now? Is Rust adopted by electrical engineers, computer science students, or are they not doing Rust? Can you comment on that? Uh, I'd be very surprised if electrical and sort of 
EE majors were teaching Rust, but I'd be very unsurprised. I, I would expect that they would be using Rust in, in CS to teach classes now. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I have a little experience with both of the adoption methodologies that you mentioned, primarily with greenfield projects in Rust and kind of decomposing components of existing applications and writing as a library. Um, but I'm kind of curious if, if you've seen or, or heard of any successes using, I think there are kind of two competing C to Rust translators. Um, and if, if those are things you think are worth looking into at all, if you've heard of any success with those for kind of legacy code bases potentially. Uh, my coworker, Emil, who's here today, has more experience than I do calling C from Rust. And he mm -hmm. could tell you a little bit about those tools. Okay. For this project, we use a tool called C BindGen that walks over the crate and generates the C headers. And uh, that project could be better, but it served our purpose. I think it was mostly as kind of an internal tool at Mozilla. Sure. Um, I'm not aware of the, the perhaps competing options that you're referring to, but okay. we're aware of BindGen for going one direction and C BindGen for going the other. Cool, thanks. Yep. Nice talk. If the language is so compelling, at what point are we at the point where we should start uh, demanding this kind of programming languages? from our vendors to go in protection relays and gateways and devices like that? Are we ready? Well, uh, no one's going to rewrite massive code bases overnight. We're never, you know, we're going to be with C and C++ for a long time. But I think that um, if you have vendors that are completely unaware and they're not looking at this, that may be a broader sign of a lack of security unawareness, if that makes sense. I think we're kind of at that cusp where uh, the top tier vendors, as far as security concerned, are probably starting to look at this, may be aware, and, and definitely should be. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Uh, for some of the noobs like me, where we're more scripters than programmers mm -hmm. uh, in security, and I always appreciate when you come out with a project, it's here's the Modbus client, here's the Modbus server, go play. Yep. Uh, what other projects would you recommend we look at? You mentioned Saracata. Would a good first entry level noob who's maybe familiar with programming, better at just scripting stuff, go like at a Siracata processor as a good first step into Rust? Or is there any other recommendations? That would be have? an excellent way to jump in. Maybe just find a protocol they haven't implemented or doesn't have a lot of functionality and expand their parser. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually actively looking into pop, perhaps writing Wireshark dissectors in mm -hmm. Rust and calling the C Wireshark uh, API from Rust. So that would be kind of another good one for networking pen tester types to kind of right. dip into Rust. Cool. And if you could throw on Twitter, because I, I could Google, but I mean, you obviously have to teach yourself this because yep. Rust is relatively new. Maybe some of those curated resources for, for noobs to go after, you know, what book, what yeah, I'll blog, do a, what, Yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do a, a tweet series sometime awesome. today with some what I think are some good starter links, perhaps for non-professional developer awesome. types. And thanks again. It's always good content. So yeah, thank you. It. So great talk, thanks. Uh, one of the reasons I personally believe that C, uh, YC isn't dead yet is that it's pretty much straightforward when you are reading from a binary and you know, reading the data to a struct or things like this, you can guarantee a struct is aligned in memory the way you put it. So uh, can Rust do this uh, same kind of thing? Yeah, Rust has a feature called like, uh, you can put attributes on, on structs that basically specify memory alignment. Okay. So, you, you, I mean, Rust is built for the purpose of doing embedded systems and operating systems. So all those sort of features of C where you're very concerned about what the hardware and the memory is doing, you can do in Rust. Okay, thank you. And then when you're writing the bindings to call it from C, you have to annotate it with um, representation C to say use the same memory layout for the struct that C would use. Okay, Perfect. So it's very interoperable in that way. Cool, thanks. Yep. Okay, any other questions? All right, awesome, thank you, Adam. Thank you.